It's telling us, if you can see here, it has uh, heat units on this side. So it's units in the thousands, and then it has times per minute, okay? So what, sometimes you will see a chart like this, and what it's saying is, if you had, for example, uh, I don't know, 50,000 heat units, okay, which is pretty low, 50,000 heat units here, how long will it take to get it back to zero? So you have, you're gonna have to wait all of this time, okay? So once again, uh, it, it's just follow the chart. How concerned am I that you will see this? On a test you will, <laughs> but in real life you might not see this. I mean, this is equipment that we use in the 70s and 80s, yeah. But nowadays, I, I don't see this anymore, okay? But you will get this information when you make exposures. That you will. And so, now, technology is a little bit better, and so you have quicker uh, cooling times. So you might not need to wait an hour. I mean, who's gonna, look, this is what, 15 minutes, this is two minutes, but who's gonna wait 12 minutes for the tube to cool off? We used to do that in CT, back in the uh, late 80s, and you did an abdomen, for example, you only did whoop, about 10 pictures, and then you waited for this thing to cool off. You waited, and then whoop, did another set, and you waited. So CTs were very slow. They're not, just to give you a sense of how long it took. Nowadays, you can do an abdomen. Well, let's include the chest. Chest, abdomen, and pelvis, you can do it probably in 12 seconds. Go, boom. Second. Back in the 80s, just to do an abdomen, just to do the first part, abdomen pelvis. This <laughs> first part, probably, um, first part was say 30 seconds to scan, and then you waited about 10 minutes for the thing to cool off. And then you did another set, and then another set. So at exam time, say for the whole thing, was I don't know, 35 minutes, 40 minutes. Nowadays, you can do it in 12 seconds. So, technology has improved in that respect that the cooling time is, is a lot quicker. So just be aware of them, okay? Uh, so thermal units can be given to you in, in different values, and they're all valid units. Uh, calories, okay? Uh, BTUs, which I don't remember what they are. Uh, I can't remember. Uh, British thermal units or something. British thermal units, that's what it is. Yeah, British thermal units, joules, okay. Uh, heat units is what are typically used for our machines. And this is important, okay. So depending on the type of, uh, depending on the KBP that you use, the mass and the time, the MA and the time, now you can have the heat units, okay. And it's coming up. But in just a bit, you'll see <laughs> heat units, for example, you, you, what you do is you multiply the KVP, DMA, and the mass. So mass and KVP, and that will give you heat units, okay? And a, a lot of the newer machines, that's what they give you. That's what they present to you. And that's what it is here, too, as you can see, okay? And the hotter, okay, the hotter an X-ray to get, the longer it needs to cool off, okay? Uh, so, more heat, this is important, more heat will be created with three-phase than single-phase units. If you go back to the charts that I did on the previous slide, that's what you see here. More heat with any of these high MA stations, you create more heat, okay? All right, and you will need more time dissipation, okay? So, more heat with three-phase than single-phase units. And so, how many heat units you can create? So if you are, uh, let's see, oops, sorry. So how to calculating the heat units. Oops, sorry. Ah, let me see. Here is where I wanna go. Okay, so KVP, mass, and the rectification constant. What is that rectification constant? Rectification constant has, is this value here. This value here, uh, you will use it only for single phase units, okay? Okay? Three phase, 
minutes. Oh, 1.4? Okay. Sorry. And, and they're including the high frequency too? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry, guys. So the 1.4, because it's creating more heat. I'm sorry. It's creating more heat, so that's why you add this factor here. 1.4. Okay. With three phase, with three phase, you're creating more heat, so that's why the 1.4 is, is multiplied to it. For single phase, you ignore it. Okay. For high frequency, and I'll I'll keep what your textbook is saying. For uh, high frequency, your textbook is saying use 1.4, and that's fine. Be if you look deeper, it's actually a higher number. Is 1.7, 1.65, 1.7. Let's keep it at 1.4. Let's make life easier for you and me. At 1.4, anything that is not a single phase. Nothing. One. One. Okay? Question? Yeah. No. no. <laughs> okay. I just want, I'm sorry. So just to clarify. Yeah. So you only use the 1.4 just for a three phase, and then you take it off. Three phase and high frequencies. And, high, and then you take yeah. it off for single phase. Uh huh. Yeah. So, but let's keep it at 1.4 for for everything. Yeah. 1.4 for everything. All right. So this is what you have. So KVP time rectification constant. So that 1.4 is the rectification constant. Okay. Every. <coughs> Every uh, generator will have a different constant, okay? It's like, they're slightly different, like I said before. But for us, for our purposes, 1.4 is fine, okay? All right, uh, just to show you a few things, guys. Uh, this is a sample, this is a picture of what a metal tube looks like. This is a, a Siemens design, uh, and this is what they use in CT. What they have here, the cathode is, is on this side, and then they direct, and the anode is on this side. They direct all the ex, all the electrons. They have nowhere to go, so they, they bombard it here. So it works more like an electron gun. There's always directed here. And they use magnetic fields within the tube so the, so the uh, electrons don't spread. Remember that was the problem with the glass tube? So you have the focusing cup, and so while they're in the focusing cup, yeah, they are compressed, but once they leave, they both spread. That doesn't happen here. That's one of the advantages, one of many advantages you have with metal, that you can put through metal, you can put in a small current, right? But in, can you do that with glass? Glass is not a very good conductor, not a very good conductor, and so you can do that. Yeah? Is that in a vacuum? It's still a vacuum. It's yes, still a vacuum. All right, and so here's the idea, take a look. So, cathode, mm -hmm. and the anode is all the way here, but it's, you have this uh, deflection coils here, and they all throughout here, and they direct where uh, these electrons are going. So, okay. Would that be isotropic as well? Huh? Would that be isotropic? It's still isotropic, yeah. Um, the, the advantage is that you have more electrons going and hitting the target. That's one of many. And then you see here, um, all of this is rotating as before. You still have the oil. And outside here is where I said they have the, uh, the wires that run chill water throughout. I mean, people have tried different ideas. Uh, next year, we're gonna do, okay, this is the end of this section, guys. And just before we end, so, so you know what's going on with x-ray tubes. People are doing different things. Because remember, this is more than 100 years old. This concept, okay, it's more than 100 years old. But back in the late 80s, a company here, I can't remember the name of the company, but a company here in Brisbane, the Bay Area has done a lot of stuff, guys. I mean, incredible stuff. I mean, for example, uh, Varian, who used to be here in Redwood City, they, are the, they, they were, not anymore they were the largest producer of x-ray tubes in the world. All kinds of designs and stuff. Uh, but also, one thing that you, you, this, I always, I'm fascinated with this concept. Uh, in, in, what you have in CT, you have an x-ray tube that goes around the patient, right? The tube, the patient is moving in, in the uh, CT couch, and you have a, a CT tube that is going around. Well, these people, these guys up in uh, 
Brisbane. Uh, what they did was this. They had a, um, this was the, their concept. So they had an electron gun. The electron gun only does is just shoot electrons, right? So shoot an electron gun. And then what they had was they had a set of rings here. Okay, and so what they did is they shoot the electrons into these tungsten rings. Okay, and so when you they hit the tungsten ring, what do you what do you create? You can create photons, right? And then they have the X-ray table here, and so the patient was technically inside an X-ray tube. So you've had this massive electron gun. Okay, they have these rings here, and the thing is going like this. And so it's creating, the patient is right there. Heat is not a problem. Okay, and you're saying, well, but it's not a vacuum. Yeah, but you're shooting so many electrons then. Not a problem. Anyway, it worked, and they use it for about, there are still a few out there uh, that still use this concept because it was so, you can do a CT scan of the heart while the heart is beating. So they use it a lot in, in CT cardiology. Uh, anyway, GE bought the uh, bought the company, and they store the concept. Yeah, it's right here. It's, it's just they store it. So they store it. it. Nobody can use it. Yeah, because and you say, well, why will they do that? This is a great. Well, think of GE too. I mean. Yeah, for one thing, they don't want competition because this was a great concept. And it's just a matter of working the little kinks and details and this thing can be, this thing is the future, really. But GE had invested so much into the uh, traditional CT systems, and which is, the new systems are great, but it's, and they have surpassed this. But I think if they, if they, if, you put 10 good engineers and scientists working on something like this, they can improve it. This was a tiny company in Brisbane. I mean, they were making, I don't know, three or four CT scanners a year. So it was it was in a small company. Uh, <coughs> but anyway, that, so people are coming up with new ideas all the time. It's just that a lot of times you have the big guys saying, you can do that. It's called the EBCT, Electron Beam uh, CT. You guys can Google it, EBCT, Electron Beam CT. It was great. Yeah, it was a, it was a, a great concept. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I can't I, I buy it just happened about a month no like three months ago. I had a patient in CT, and he started asking me questions about CT, and I'm going. Guys, really curious or is testing me? <laughs> and anyway, I think it was testing me. Anyway, because it happened, it just happened that he was one of the engineers that worked on this concept. Oh, wow. Yeah, on this concept. And then he asked me, "Do you know what the EBCT is?" And I, because I, I really like it, and I was saying he, he was, he liked it, right? And we start talking and we back and forth. Anyway, the guy they sold the company. I don't know. He was in a staggering number. Not him. No, he was not the owner. He was just an engineer. Uh, but the owner got all this money. Anyway, he's working on other stuff. He said they are working with still with X-rays, but this for now they cannot touch it. I think the contract said they cannot do anything with this like for 50 years. Crazy. I mean, GE can, but they cannot. Anybody else cannot. Uh, but they are doing other stuff. And he said, "Oh, you'll be impressed when we're going to come out with it." I said, "Hey, give me a hint." He said, "Oh." Then he, all he said was, oh, we have this idea about, uh, about using, uh, uh, you can use uh, some semiconductors too, so you don't generate a lot of heat. And I remember when I was in grad school, they, they, they were working with detectors that use semiconductors. I said, oh, maybe that's better. So anyway, he didn't want to say anything. 